I'm happy to be here. I am from Geoff School District and I do recognize quite a few faces. Just out of curiosity, who here has been to Juab School District, like actually been in our district? C4. There you go. So our district has a reputation. I'm not going to say it's good or bad, but it does have a reputation. Um, and, and I'm curious, when you hear, those of you that have been to Juab, what do you think of? Rick, can I pick on you? In one word, how would you describe Juab? Well, I can't do it one word, but Confidency base. Confidence base. Ryan, what would you come up with? Innovative. Innovative? Yeah. Okay. Um, any other thoughts on what you think of those that have been to Juab? Insightful. Um, micro credentials. Micro credentials. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so some of these different spaces that we've kind of uh, embedded in our practices and, and processes in our district. So today, um, when, when I was asked to, to speak and, and the topic to speak on becoming human alongside tech, I was really excited. When I sent in my slide deck, I got an email back and I could quickly tell that where I was going with this conversation was probably not exactly where they were hoping I was going with this conversation. Um, I got a response like, this is a really interesting slide. I'm gonna just assume that was a good thing. So anyways, um, Reed Hoffman, who is the co-founder of LinkedIn, he says this about, about uh, in technology. Improvement through technology is how humanity most effectively makes progress, okay? And we could, we could argue about the idea of what is progress, what does that mean, what is humanity, how do you define it? Those are all things that we could spend a long, long time talking about. Um, but uh, for the sake of today's conversation, I want to focus on just kind of where we've been in education with technology and what that's been. And that is that we've really chased technology as a way to be more efficient, okay? And as we've chased technology as a way to be more efficient in all its different forms, we really have seen technology evolving on a broad scale to try to replicate things that we've relied on humans to do forever in the name of efficiency. And education has jumped right on the back of that. And when we in, embed technology in our schools, we're always trying to do something that makes, makes us more efficient. But this idea of efficiency has some, has some potential drawbacks, okay? No sooner had, had we started developing technology, particularly in the sense of computers. So this was the fear from the first time, from the first time that we started developing computers that you could, you know, electronically input or electronically programmable computers. The first one was named Colossus. The British developed it to crack codes during World War II. And not very long after that, people's minds started to run wild. Because for everything positive and good about technology, what were people imagining? Apocalypse. I'll be back. Okay. They were imagining the worst, and, and you can see that play out in pop culture. You can see these ideas that, that technology is going to destroy humanity. It's going to take over. We are going to create something so efficient that it replaces us. Here we are in 2023, and as was pointed out, reality has true, you know, those fears have pre proven true, and it is, it is chat GTP. Um, and the idea that we have this thing that is smarter than, than, than people are, that it is capable of replacing people. Um, you've seen it in the news. You've seen people jumping on this saying, we've got to shut it down. Park City, the superintendent can't even get on and use it in the schools. Thank goodness they're filtering it out because it's so evil that somehow it's going to damage our kids. Universities are talking about that. We can't have it. Instead of opening a conversation about how can we leverage the technology to do something better or to improve the human condition. And so that's where I'm going to talk about today mostly is this idea of how do we leverage technology and what does it mean to be human? And then where do those two intersect? And this is not a new conversation, but for sure, 
recently this conversation has been resurfaced in the news. Just this morning I, I, was, I, I read an article, same thing. Where is and when is too much tech a problem, okay? So this idea of humology has, has started to exist and creep into li literature. And, and this, this is basically the idea of what is the intersection of technology and humanity. Okay, this is a, this is a term that uh, has been coined by Scott Klosowski. Okay, and I'll let him, just a quick video, I'll let him explain kind of what, what this means to him. I remember the day that it happened, that I was sitting around thinking about this concept that in life, humans and technology are starting to integrate more and more to be able to get any kind of process done. I mean, it doesn't matter whether we're listening to music or whether we're hiring somebody or whether we're selling something, whether we're building a car, and there's more and more technology being integrated with humans. And I started thinking, well, what is the word that we use to describe that? And, and it really wasn't a word. And so uh, I wrote down a bunch of words on the board, and I started sending them around to some friends and saying, you know, what word do you like? Long and short, we ended up with this word humology. Uh, and humology became the perfect word where from then on, we all used it to describe this blending of humans and technology. <coughs> and then I started thinking, well, you gotta have a scale. I mean, you can't just have one word to explain this, you have to have a scale because everything that is involving humans and technology might involve more human or more technology. And so a scale would be helpful. And so we created this scale where on one side of the scale, if it was an H12345, that denoted that, that a process was more and more human-based. Whereas if it was T12345, it denoted that the process was more technology based. <coughs> and so with a word and with a scale, we now had a way to look at almost everything in life and be able to talk about it in terms of, well, where is it moving? Is this something that, that has always been done completely by humans, by hand, and now it's being done more and more by software, or more and more by a robot? But at least gave us a vocabulary to be able to talk about this concept. And then the more we understood the concept, the more we started seeing the world through this lens of humology, this lens of how much are we using human to get something done versus technology. Now the reason it's important to understand that is there is a perfect spot. There is a perfect spot for almost any process, the most efficient, uh, the least expensive, uh, the most creative. I mean, there is a perfect spot on the continuum. So for example, if you talk about hiring people, we're never probably going to have software and robots that can go find an employee, interview an employee, and make a hiring decision. We probably just won't trust machines to do that. Now, we might trust machines to find the person, but we wouldn't trust <coughs> machines to make a decision on hiring them. What if we talk about a funeral home? I mean, will we trust machines to actually go pick up the body, to prepare the body, to pick out a casket, to bury the body, and a machine to go ahead and say the final words? I mean, would it be okay if we all Skyped into the funeral? I mean, we're not prepared for that kind of thing yet. Yeah, I actually don't think that's so not And so it's the interesting once you start seeing the world through this humological lens, because when you see humology in this way, it, it changes your thinking about trying to find that proper point. It, it makes you think about, well, are we using too much human in this process so it's inefficient and it's not scalable anymore? Versus, are we using too much technology in this process? It doesn't feel good. There's no empathy. There's no sympathy. There's no creativity. There's no sensing of emotion because there's a machine that I'm talking to. Once you understand that, then you can start looking for that perfect point. Now, when I think about this from a spiritual sense, if I think about it from a good and evil, or I think about it from a healthy or unhealthy, what I start to understand is when you get to the wrong place on the, on the humology scale, you create a situation that can be unhealthy. So for example, kids and texting. If you think about the amount of words or the amount of connections that a child has through texting, and you said, well, they had 700 conversations in the course of a week over their texting, versus how many conversations did they have in person? You say, oh, well, they only had 20 conversations in person. Or you look at the amount of electronic connection with any one person in your life versus the amount of face-to-face -face human connection. Well, then you start to see that you, you can get off on your, your humology balance to where you're engaging with technology way too much. And when you engage with technology way too much, or you try to build a relationship with way too much technology involved, you strip the humanity from it. That's not a good thing. It might be an efficient thing, 
but it is not a good thing if every conversation that you have is through a text message or an email. It is not healthy for you as a human being. Right? If every process that you do becomes some interface with technology, it's almost like if every meal you cook was cooked in a microwave. Is that really ultimately a healthy thing for you? This is the reason why humology is important, because it gives us a sense of how much human should we keep in our life versus how much technology should we use to augment what we do to create more convenience or to create a better life. Because getting the balance off is going to be extremely painful for us in a lot of psychological ways. All right. So. So Scott talks about this idea of humology, and I, I'm sure most of you have heard this term before and maybe even have heard Scott speak. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to listen to him. It's pretty powerful, um, and it, it resonates. The message resonates across a lot of things we're talking about. It is this idea of, of where do we find that sweet spot. So what does that look like in education? A... Does every child we have in our system look the same? Does every teacher that we're trying to help teach the same? Does every administrator have the same tools to lead? And the answer to that we all well know is no, they don't. And so what do we do to try to, to, to reflect that? One of the big things in traditional education, which we beat to death today, is this idea of Let's just find an average, okay? This is traditional education. What generally works for generally the most kids to get generally the best <coughs> response? Okay, Todd Rose, author of The End of Average, who's also a Utah native, educated, well, kind of educated up the road in Davis, if I remember correctly. He said this, human beings don't line up perfectly. There's no average learner. They have strengths and weaknesses. They all do. Even geniuses do. What is the implication for that in our schools? We need to differentiate. Okay. We know, we know that we have to do different for different kids. We know that teachers have to teach differently based on their strengths. We know that administrators have to lead based on their strengths. And they need support based on their weaknesses, each one of us. Okay? And all of us have what's called a jagged profile. If you're not familiar with jagged profiles, it's something that's easy to understand. It is our strengths and our weaknesses. So how do we create an educational system that no longer tries this idea of teaching to the average? Because when you teach to the average, who do you actually teach to? Nobody. Nobody, Nobody is average. Everybody is unique and everybody has strengths and everybody has weaknesses. So this is where you get into the idea of personalized learning. In Utah and in our district, we adhere heavily to the, to the components of PCBL, personalized competency-based learning. Why? Because we feel like it's our best chance at meeting the needs of every student. But even doing that, where do you go when you say, I want to meet the needs of every student? You have to ask what it is that we do in classrooms, what we choose to value, and what we choose to say is our metric of success. Today in our conversations and in education in general, we talk about success. And when we talk about success and student success or school success, unfortunately, where do we oftentimes go? What do we refer to? What do we measure? What determines a successful school? Yes. Yeah, tests, test scores, assessments. Our own worst enemies sometimes in education. Because even as we talk about success and what it is and how we value ourselves, how our teachers value themselves, how our students value themselves, we go to probably one of the least reliable, least accurate, and least valued metrics that we could that's going to point to a little person's future self-worth, existence, their humanity. What is their place in, in, in our world, okay? So you've seen Portrait of Graduates. We've talked about Portrait of Graduates. Um, 
This is Juab's portrait of a graduate, and this is kind of our North Star. This is how we started the conversation. We went to our community and we said, look, tell us what you value, and that's what we will try to prepare our students to be able to do or be able to have or be able to possess or be able to demonstrate. And it's not just test scores. So what are those things that you want students to have? And this is what they came up with. Knowledge, skills, and dispositions. Our community said, yes, we think that it's important that our students do well in school, but even that being said, we have students that we know want to go to college, and that means one thing for academics. But I also have students that just want to go into the business world or into the workforce. That means something totally different in academic preparation. We have people that want to go and be military ready. And that means something totally different. And we have some kids, bless their hearts, that are just hoping to be independent, live life independently. And that means something totally different to them. But they get to make a choice. They get to look at what it looks like. Am I going to Harvard or am I going to the community college down the street? I have to have a different level of preparation. ACT tells me 22 and I'm ready to go. Unfortunately, last time I checked, 22 didn't do you much good in Harvard. I set myself up for failure. My system set that student up for failure. We lied to them about what success was. Okay, skills. When I came in today, I heard a group, I should have turned around and maybe you'll own up to this, that was talking about what people are looking for in industry. And I heard statements like this, and I don't want to misrepresent them, but it was roughly this. They really don't care about what you know. They just want you to know you have some good soft skills. You can come in, they'll train you to do whatever you want them to, what they want you to do. We just need people can show up, that can work hard, that are honest. Skills. Communication, collaboration. You heard the little guys on our video this morning from, from Salt Lake School District. We just want to know how to communicate when people disagree. That's what we need to know. How can I have a conversation in a diverse group? Guess what one of our indicators that any kindergartner in Juab School District can tell you? They can define and tell you what the conference is. How do I communicate in a diverse environment? First graders can tell you what it looks like for them. Second graders can tell you what it looks like for them. All the way up to a senior that can tell you, as a graduate of high school, this is what it means to communicate with diverse environments or in diverse environments. Okay? Um, dispositions, grit, curiosity. Those soft skills, those things that we know are intrinsic to, to, to students' mental wellness, social emotional well-being. Okay, these are what our community really, really valued. So why do I bring that up in a conversation about becoming human alongside tech? It's because how we use tech should be based on the purpose we're using tech. In other words, what is our outcome we're trying to create? And if that outcome doesn't mean better people, better relationships, then you probably shouldn't be using it because it won't end well for you. You'll have parents that are upset. My kids just get sat in front of a computer all day long. Nobody even talks to them. Unfortunately, the majority of our secondary students come to school every single day, and more days than not, nobody in that building says their name. That is a true statistic. What does that say for humanity? Okay? And humanity has to be the target. So here we go. Speaking specifically to Juab School District, here is what a student would see on Canvas in a typical classroom for a specific day. What do you notice about this teacher's welcome to my class today when you walk in, bell ring? What looks very similar to most classrooms anywhere in the, anywhere? Can you tell what academically is important that day? Can you see the, 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 the I can statement? 
the outcomes that are academically based. Yeah. What else do you see that you might not typically see in a normal class? <coughs> what are they focusing on the on March 1st? Grit. Disposition of grit. Okay. What else? You can see that it's actually in two places. One is the micro-credential or the badging for the student, which they can use to put into their own portfolio that they're building around their portrait of a wasp. The other is the intention. They're both there because it's the first of the month. The month, the whole school is focusing on grit. If you go back a month before to February, what were they focusing on in February? Teamwork, but on this specific day, you can't really see it, but that is the micro or badging, effective listening. Why is grit here? What day of the month is it? It's the first, so what do we need to do if it's a competency? We need to intentionally establish what it means to us, not that it means to everyone in the world equally, but for us, this is what grit means. This is what it looks like. This is what you can do to demonstrate competency of it. Again, I bring this up as part of technology because when this teacher or any of our teachers choose then to engage technology in their classroom, they're going to make sure that they are focusing in on all of those aspects. Okay, they're going to leverage technology to help students, all of their students, to individually personalize and, and dive into these different things. So what does that look like then for our actual students? So you see this young man here in the blue shirt. I have permission to use his name. His name's Broden. And as you can tell, Broden is a, is a great kid. You can tell just by his smile. But you can also tell that he has some physical limitations, right? Well, Broden was a seventh grader in this picture. And he was working on his portrait of a, of a wasp, which is what our middle schoolers do. They're not graduates. They're working on a portrait of a wasp in the middle school. So his portfolio, and he had learned about communication in device, diverse environments. And he had also learned about leadership and initiative, which are two badges. We would call them indicator badges within collaboration and communication, which both fall under skills. Well, he learned one day or heard that our high school football team had some kids that were whining about not getting enough playing time. We have a pretty good football program. We, we have an exceptional football program. And everyone in our community looks up to them. And this little seventh grader, who will never get to play football, went to his principal, who happened to be also the head football coach, and he said, Principal Bowering, I have heard that there's kids that are complaining about not getting enough playing time. He says, I'm working on my portrait of a wasp. I need some evidence to put in my portfolio. Can I come and talk to them? So for a seventh grader to go sit down with a bunch of sophomores, juniors, and seniors, <coughs> football players, he went in and he basically had a come to Jesus meeting with them about why they should be so grateful to have the opportunity to do what they do. Connecting opportunities with student outcomes that are driven by students are on the backside. So I ask you, when it comes to humanity, is this, is this student on his way to becoming a better human. Yeah. Powerful, powerful conversation. Kids crying. And he said, I'll never play football. But I am happy. I am so happy and I get to watch you guys play football. And I get to support you. This team went on to go to the state championship again. And you can see behind them, they had him come down after every game. They brought him down, made him an honorary member of the team. Had a huge impact. Do you think we heard another <coughs> peep out of those kids? Not again. But what does this have to do with technology? What it has to do with technology is intention. 
if we're not intentional, uh, intention, if, if <laughs> my mind just, if we are not clear about our intentions with what we're trying to teach our students or what the outcomes we're trying to prepare for our students, then we don't even have a starting point to begin to decide where is the right tool, what is the right tool, and how should we use that tool most effectively to reach the outcome. We use technology to be efficient, but efficient is not the outcome. Efficient is what we're trying to achieve to better accomplish those outcomes. So here you have an actual class. And this is becoming more and more typical in our classrooms. I, um, I don't know if you can see it well up on there, but if you, if you can look into their iPads, we're one to one. All of our students have access. You know, our teachers use LMS. Canvas is our LMS and lots of different programs. What you'll notice is each one of these, this is a sewing class. How many of you took a home ec sewing type class or a shop class in high school? Anything along those lines? Do you remember how long it took to get to where you actually got to go do something? Forever. Forever. Guess what? Kids walk into class, that's what they see. They take their iPad, their smartphone, they scan the QR code based on wherever they're at, takes them to a miniature video that the teachers created. How many times, I'm, I'm guilty, do you, I bet you my teacher came 20 times to show me how to thread a sewing machine. And I still don't know how, I have no idea how to do it. Every one of these kids can just scan the QR code. How much time do you think this teacher spends showing kids how to thread or set the bobbin or thread the machine? Zero. Which means the teacher's free to work on relationships, directing instruction, correcting students where they're at. But students also are engaged because instead of saying, hey, I need help, they can say, I need help specifically with this. I have seen how to thread the, I've watched you do this, but some reason I'm still doing it wrong. Does she still need to teach? Yeah, she still needs to teach. Is she leveraging technology? Absolutely. But the purpose of leveraging that technology is to give her more time to meet the individual needs of every student, where they're at, when they're, when they're ready to, 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 to receive help. The last thing that I would share with all of us here is as leaders in our different spaces, our different sphere of influences, we all have the ability to influence how technology is being used in our buildings, in our districts. The thing that I would encourage each one of us to consider is what is the message we put behind the use of technology. Becoming human alongside tech really comes down to this quote, like, well, to me, this quote from Aristotle. Educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. And I firmly believe that about the job we do, and I firmly believe it about, you know, technology. There is no one right way to use any piece of technology. But you can always have the right intention when you engage technology. And with that, I think you leave yourself in a place that people will respect, parents understand, and will be grateful for, and so will your students. So with that, if you have any questions about anything we do in JUAB, we're pretty much an open book. We're just trying to figure stuff out. Please come and see us. And if you have great things, we'd love to come see what you're doing as well. So thank you.